So now we'll be starting with Pythagoras. We're now jumping back in time. So Pythagoras' life actually overlaps Thales' life. So he, I'm not even sure if, uh, if uh, Heraclitus, yeah, so Heraclitus, 535 to 475 BC. He would have overlapped a bit. So he would have actually overlapped quite a bit with Pythagoras. Did Parmenides just never die? Uh, so <laughs> some people. Some people think so. He was just born smart. <laughs> no change. He could have died. Yeah. Uh, he was the. <laughs> So these dates are very, very rough estimates. When we can't even get rough estimates on their birth and death, like within 20 years, and we just have nothing to go by, and we just have a single year that we know for sure they were alive, we call that their floret. So it said that he was flourishing in the year 475. So he was born sometime before that, we don't know, and born sometime after that, we don't know, and we don't have a good way yet of estimating it. But all these dates are estimates. I think the first person that we have a concrete date on is Aristotle. Even Plato is still speculated. Was he actually born these years or three years earlier, whatever the gap is there. Okay, so now we're moving to Pythagoras, probably one of the most interesting of these guys. Pythagoras of Samos. So Samos is this island over here. Miletus was on the mainland. Samos, it's both the name of the island and the city on the island. Now, Samos, since it's this island, when Persia conquers Lydia, they don't get Samos. And so Samos actually supports Egypt in its fight against Persia early on. So Samos isn't conquered by the Persians the same way that mainland uh, Lydia is. Okay. But, so that's where he's from. He's the first one to actually call himself a philosopher. Now notice he comes earlier than a bunch of these guys, so that's not so strange. Uh, what's he famous for? Famous for the Pythagorean theorem, the five regular solids, and the theory of proportion, representing things as uh, ratios. That's the theory of proportion. Discovered musical notes could be expressed mathematically, one of his most famous discoveries. Claimed Earth was spherical and divided Earth into five climate zones. Pretty impressive. Discovered that the morning and evening star were the same, namely Venus. He's also the one who coined the term mathematics. He's going to be our second mathematician. You have Thales, and then there's going to be Pythagoras. And Pythagoras is going to do a lot more development on top of what Thales did. Possibly the first one to give a completely deductive geometric proof. It's very possible that when you are reading Euclid's Elements, you are actually reading a proof put together by Pythagoras. Thales was the first one to explicitly start using deductive reasoning, but Pythagoras is supposed to have been the first one to put down a proof that we would say, yep, today that constitutes a proof. So, in terms of mathematics, he's the first one building on top of what Thales started. How related was he to the Egyptians, like, his life? We will cover a picture of his life. The answer is very probably. <laughs> 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 All right, uh, the five regular solids. These come up a bit, so good to understand what they are. Here's the name of the game. I tell you, I want you to build dice for me. Here's the rules. Whatever the faces of the dice are have to be congruent shapes. And they have to be equal lateral shapes. So you can either use equilateral triangles, equilateral squares, equilateral pentagons, hexagons, whatever you want, but you've got to build dice for me this way. So you can only use what we call regular shapes, equilateral shapes, to build me these dice. Question, how many dice could you make me? The answer is just these five. And it's not hard to see why. When we look at the corner of a die, notice it has to have at least three faces touching it. Right? Yeah. So here we have three faces touching it. When you build your dice with triangles, and you have three faces touching each corner, you have the tetrahedron, tetrahedron which is a four-sided die. If I were to make four triangles touch each uh, corner here, four faces touch each corner, then we would end up with the octahedron which is an eight-sided die. If I were to make five triangles touch each corner, so notice we have five faces all touching at that corner, then we would get the isosahedron. What would happen if I had six triangles all touching at the corner? You couldn't get a die because it would be completely flat. It doesn't fold on itself anymore. Each triangle 
That angle right there is 60 degrees. If I have 60 degrees three six times, that's 360 degrees. It's now completely flat. It can no longer fold in on itself. Okay. So you cannot build a dice with these equilateral triangle faces where you have six triangles touching at a corner. You can do it where you have three. You can do it where you have four. You can do it where you have five. You can't do six anymore. That's 360 degrees. It's completely flat. So these are all the ones that you can do with triangles. Similar argument if you make the faces, each one a square. Here's where you have three touching at a corner. What would happen if I tried to get four squares all touching at a corner? It'd be completely flat. Each square is 90 degrees. If I got four things touching at 90 degrees, that's 360 degrees. It can't fold in on itself anymore. So this is the only one we can build with four sides. Here's the only one we can build with five sides. Each angle on a pentagon, that's 102 degrees. If we tried to do four of them, touching together, that's impossible. You can't have four pentagons all touching each other at one corner with their edges also touching like that. You need 408 degrees in a circle, but there's only 360 degrees. So getting four pentagons to touch each other, not even possible. And then why can't we have a six-sided shape, a bunch of hexagons touching each other? If three hexagons touch each other, each angle of a hexagon is 120 degrees, that's 360 degrees. That's flat. Those of you who played Settlers are used to this fact. Yeah. The map uses hexagons, and you can make those hexagons all touch each other because it's perfectly flat. If you tried to lay out your map with pentagons, it'd be a nightmare. Mm -hmm. Won't work. So that's why these are the five regular solids and the only five regular solids that there are. Can't come up with any more. Huh? Sphere. Not a regular solid. There's rules for it. It has to have a finite number of sides, be composed of polygons. Okay, a little bit about his life. We're gonna do the high level version of his life and then get a little bit more detail for each of these. <laughs> now the story goes that either Pythagoras' dad or his mom, I may tell as always his mom, she visited the Pythia, or that's the Oracle of Delphi. Uh, probably should have pointed this out on the map. Delphi is, the Greek thought Delphi was the center of the world. It looks like it's the center of the Greek peninsula, they thought it was the center of the world. And a bunch of these Greek cities each has their patron god. The patron god of Athens was Athena. The patron god of Olympia was Zeus. The patron god at Delphi was Apollo. And Apollo, he's the god of the sun, but he's also the god of visions. And so you go to his oracle at, his, at Delphi if you want to get these prophecies. Because he's the god of prophecies. He's the god of prophesying. So this oracle at Delphi, she is, it's very common for early Greeks to go there to get her advice, indirectly getting the god Apollo's advice, is the way that they saw it. So now this, and so she's called the Pythia. We're going to notice Pythia and Pythagoras, related. <laughs> so the Pythia, oracle at Delphi, prophesied to his mother, while she was pregnant with him, that she would give birth to a man supremely beautiful, wise, and beneficial to humankind. She then went by, meaning Pythagoras' mom, from there on out, she went by Pythias, in honor of the Pythia. So Pythagoras' mom changed her name to Pythias, and she decided to name her son Pythagoras. Can't remember the exact etym etymology on this word, but something like the word of the Pythia, or something like that. Basically, she named him the person the, the oracle at Delphi foretold would come. So that's where his name comes from, Pythagoras. Now, uh, born on Samos... Uh, some speculation that the legendary figure Orpheus was at Samos when he was born. Orpheus is the legendary founder of the Orphic religion, which we'll have a little bit more to say down the road. And he left when Polycrates uh, was the tyrant. This is one of the ways we're able to date him. So Polycrates, at the city of Samos, through political maneuvering, is able to make himself the tyrant over the city. He's not a tyrant established by Persia. He just, from internal squabbles, was able to become tyrant of that city. So he comes to control, and we know that Pythagoras left the city when he was in control. One of the ways we did it. Now, a bunch of speculation about what he actually did. I'm giving you one potential scenario. Don't want to go over all of them. So he left when Paul Crates came to power, and he traveled to Miletus. And Miletus went to Aves was there. Their lives overlap. After that, he seems to have traveled to Crete, then traveled to Egypt, and particularly Thebes. Then he travels to Babylon when Egypt gets captured by Cambyses II. Then he traveled back to Samos. 
After Samos, he moves to Croton, which is over in Italy. And then, ultimately, locals attacked him and his followers, forcing him to travel to Metapontum, which is where he dies. So that's a brief overview. Now I'm going to show all that on the map, and then we'll go into more detail on each of these. So he starts over here at Samos. Supposed to have traveled to Miletus, where he meets Thales. Travels down to Crete, then down to Egypt, all the way down to Thebes. Thebes isn't on the map, but it's in Upper Egypt, which is further up the Nile. Remember, Nile flows that way. So it goes to Thebes. Uh, the Persian Empire eventually conquers Egypt. He's taken as a prisoner back to Babylon, off the map over here somewhere. He's eventually able to get his freedom, comes back to Samos, tries to set up a school, fails, moves to Croton, ends up getting attacked by locals, ends up at Metapontum, where he dies. Since his most influential stuff was done over here. We call him an Italian philosopher. Okay. So let's uh, dig a little bit more into the details of his life. I think I skipped it. Okay. So here's how this works. So supposedly he went to Miletus and he went to meet with Thales. Remember, Thales is the only great mathematician prior to Pythagoras. So, meet with Thales, and apparently Thales told him that he needs to go to Egypt. He needs to go there, see all the information they have. Remember, Egypt is Egypt. It's a very stable society. They've been collecting empirical data for a long time now. Thales is telling him, you need to go get access to what they got. Same way Thales did. And it's possible that he stopped in Crete along the way. And it's possible that that's where he got his Orphic uh, influence. But somewhere along the way, he got his Orphic influence. Anyways, so he goes to Egypt. Uh, the priests... In Lower Egypt, they refuse to take him on. They tell him, keep going up along the Nile, and maybe the priest up there will take you in. He eventually gets to Thebes and finds a priest willing to educate him. Now, he actually joins the priest. He becomes an Egyptian priest. So the story goes. And he's in Egypt, speculations from somewhere from about 10 to 15 years. He learned Egyptian hieroglyphs, he became an Egyptian priest, and he was able to finally study all the geometry that the Egyptians had accumulated over time. But in Egypt... Geometry was not points, lines, and planes, but rather stakes, ropes, and fields. It was not, it was physical and void of abstraction. Remember, these Egyptians have no concept of abstraction yet. All their tricks that they find for coming up with area are area of fields. And this concept of area, they don't have. There's, what do you mean? Area of what? It doesn't make sense to talk about area. So, goes there, starts studying there. So, while the Egyptians had cataloged a lot of useful mathematical information... The notion that a line could be used to represent a rope, the edge of the field, or the path of crow flies had not yet occurred to them. It's one of the things that makes the Greeks take off. They're the first ones to start doing this abstraction, especially in mathematics. Pythagoras learned Egyptian hieroglyphs, became a priest, and was initiated into their sacred rites, giving them access to all their information. <laughs> it's very weird. To give you a high-level version of Pythagoras, on one side, you've got just this absolute prodigy genius mathematician. On the other side, you've got this mystic cult leader. He, like, covers both these ends of the spectrum. And so there's a lot of mysticism to him. At the same time, there's a lot of amazing mathematics being done by him. And the Pythagorean school that he ends up setting up and the Pythagoreans that go on, they've always got these two elements to him. It's very fascinating. Very strange personality. Now, ultimately, Egypt was captured by Cambyses II. He conquered Egypt, took him to Babylon. There, he was able to attain his freedom, learn Babylonian mathematics. Now, remember, what were the Babylonians developing? The 60. They were using a base 66. Base 66. Base 60 system. <laughs> yes. But they were developing arithmetic. They were more interested in time and talking about time and measuring time. So while the Egyptians were focused on geometry, in particularly for taxation reasons... You were taxed based off of how much uh, land you had, essentially. How much the Nile flooded onto your land. The Babylonians were more interested in time. So there he's able to study arithmetic. And so between Egypt, Thales, and Babylon, he's pretty much got the state of the art for the way mathematics is in his day. He's pretty much gone to the big three. That's pretty much everywhere you can go to get exposed to what is known at the time. So great exposure. And then he eventually makes his way back to St. Amos. Upon returning to Samus, now understand that this is potentially 20 to 30 years later. This 
little kid prodigy goes, leaves his city, and he's coming back 20 to 30 years later. After becoming an Egyptian priest, who knows if he was also a priest in Babylon, studying all this mathematics, accumulates some wealth, comes back to the city. He instantly gets a reputation. Upon returning to Samuel's, rumors instantly rose up around him. One of the rumors, he was said to have attacked and bit off the head of a poisonous snake. <laughs> Another story about it. It was said that a thief broke into his house, looked around and saw all the strange items that Pythagoras had acquired, and got out of there without taking anything. Too weird. Wasn't worth it. <laughs> These were the type of stories coming up around Pythagoras. And then Pythagoras' birth story, along with some golden birthmark he had on his side, led a lot to speculate that he was actually the son of Apollo. Remember how closely tied to Apollo he is. His name is Pythagoras. He's named after the Pythia, Apollo's oracle. Was in a way. supremely beautiful as well? Yeah. Uh, that's what that said. I don't know that if we have any uh, reference to, yep, he was a good looking guy. That was in his prophecy. It was in the prophecy. <laughs> But I would guess that he was a very charismatic person. Anyways, so when he goes back to Samos, uh, it's hard for the locals there to uh, take a liking to him. He can't get a school set up. He can't get any followers. So he decides to move to Croton instead and establish, try and establish a school there. So he moves to Croton and establishes his Pythagorean school. And it's a weird hybrid between Orphism, which we'll study more, and mathematical investigation. And there, he was able to quickly gain followers. It didn't take him long to get 300 members in his cult, religion, school, thing. Whatever we call it. We're going to call it the school from here on out. What was the school like? The school was ascetic. Not a lot of personal belonging, belongings. Communal. Whatever is owned by the school is owned by everyone. They had their secret rights that you had to go through to become members. Held men and women as equal. And believed that Pythagoras had received divine revelation. Some followers tried spreading Pythagoreanism to a nearby city, Sybaris, and were ultimately killed. Pythagoras caught on quickly, and to outsiders, uh, he's got this cult thing going on. And we don't want that in our city. People are scared of this kind of influence. It looks weird from the outside. Might look weird from the inside, too. I don't know. <laughs> but they didn't want what he was doing spreading. That was for sure. Now, we have a weird thing that ends up happening. He ends up getting caught up in politics. Here's how he ends up getting caught up in politics, which turns out to be his downfall. So in 510 BC, a tyrant took control of Sybaris. Now, Sybaris and uh, Croton, these are neighboring cities. They're close to each other. And they're kind of rival cities. They're always competing with each other. So Pythagoras, he's located at this one. Up in this city, up in Sybaris, a tyrant takes control of Sybaris, and he exiles the 500 richest people from the city, seizing their wealth. Common practice. While confiscating their wealth. The 500 that he kicks out of the city end up going down here to uh, Croton. Uh, so, let's see. So the 500 took refuge in Croton, and when the tyrant up here demands them back under threat of war with the city, Pythagoras is the one who convinces Croton not to give in and not to give them up. This leads to Croton and Sybaris going to war with each other. Sybaris ends up losing the war that they picked. And Croton ends up losing the city. Or, uh, Croton ends up looting the city. Okay. okay. Pythagoras, in this conflict, uh, became suspicious of the guy that he was supporting. And so once the battle was won, the guy, the main hotshot here ends up driving Pythagoras out of the city. So, gets involved in politics during this whole fight. That's what ends up getting him thrown out of Croton. So, though Croton won, Pythagoras and his followers were attacked by political enemies uh, that Pythagoras made during this conflict. So they have to leave. So Pythagoras ultimately moved with his followers to Metapontum, which is just further up north, where he spent the last of his days. His school ultimately splits into two. There's the Mathematicoi and the Akuzmatikoi. The Mathematicoi, the knowers, are seen as continuing his mathematical discovery. The Akuzmatikoi, his hearers, the ones who listen to his teaching, are seen as continuing his, the more religious elements of Pythagoreanism. The Mathematicoi consider the Akuzmatikoi to be their fellow Pythagoreans. The opposite is not true. The Akuzmatikoi say, no, 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 these Mathematicoi are not following to the teachings of Pythagoras. <laughs> So that's how a school ends up splitting. 
All right, orphism. Since Pythagoreanism seems to be a spin-off of orphism, to get the best feel for what these guys may have thought, it, what's typically done is you kind of do a quick analysis of orphism. So what's orphism? It's considered a reform of the Dionysian religion with a new focus on Apollo instead of Dionysus. So what's this Dionysian religion? I think Dionysus was initially a Thracian god, which is just north of Greece. But So claimed Dionysus was consumed by the Titans. Here's the way the story went. Dionysus was consumed by the Titans. Remember, the Titans represent the physical elements of this earth. So Dionysus was consumed by the Titans. In retribution, Zeus struck the Titans with lightning, turning them to ash. From these ashes, humanity is born. Man has a dual nature then. Body, inherited from the Titans, and a divine spark, or soul, inherited from Dionysus. So we got a little bit of God in us, and a little bit of Titan in us. Body and soul. And we're going to see this body-soul division in Pythagoreanism, and definitely in Plato. Plato is very much influenced by the Pythagoreans in this way. Now what do they think? In order to achieve salvation from the Titanic part of you, from the Titanic material existence, one had to undergo a ritual and maintain purification. This is why they live such an ascetic life. The things of this world tie you to this world. They appeal to the more titanic elements in you, not the more godlike elements in you. Those who fail to do so would be reincarnated. So they have this notion of reincarnation. You're constantly reincarnated, and you're trying to escape the will of reincarnation and become, hard to say again, but one with the god. So the goal is to not get reincarnated. Okay. That's the goal. And how do you do that? By purifying yourself and going through the proper rituals. So, in order to maintain their purity, <coughs> sorry, in order to maintain their purity following initiation and rituals, Orphics attempt to live an ascetic life free of spiritual contamination, most notably by adhering to strict vegetarian diet and also excluding certain types of beans from their diet. <laughs> Why? Uh, because of their view of reincarnation. There's some things that you're able to come back as. And so, in a way, eating an animal is almost cannibalistic. There's a famous story of someone whipping a dog and Pythagoras saying, please stop whipping that dog. I recognize this bark. It's a friend of mine who <laughs> <laughs> had been reincarnated. And supposedly Pythagoras claimed that he could remember some of his past lives. Weird guy. What about the beans? Uh, I'm not positive on the beans, how that comes into being. But I think it's somehow tied to if you're terrible enough. Because in each reincarnation, you're punished or rewarded based on how you do in this current carnation. If you do really good, you might be able to be reincarnated as, I don't know, a better human. <laughs> if you do badly, you might be reincarnated as a spider. If you do badly as a spider, who knows? It might be the bean is the lowest branch that you can come back as. And you might actually be able to be reincarnated as a bean. I don't know. I don't know how a bean earns something better or does a poor job as a bean. <laughs> so, a lot of this, a lot of speculation. Bertrand Russell on this. The Orphics were an ascetic set. Wine to them was only a symbol, as later in Christian sacrament. The intoxication that they sought was that of enthusiasm. So, this cult of Dionysus. Dionysus? Is that right? Yeah. This cult of Dionysus is the one who uh, introduces this word enthusiasm, which is a union with God. They believe themselves in this way to acquire mystic knowledge not obtained by ordinary means. So this is going back to the Thracians and uh, the, the religion under Dionysus where this was initially developed. Dionysus you'll know is a god of wine. So they thought by getting intoxicated and achieving enthusiasm, this is the Thracians, they thought that they were somehow becoming one with God. And that's what that feeling was. So that's how wine initially gets tied with Dionysus. Okay. And how he becomes a god of wine when he makes his way down to the Greek pantheon. Uh, Propolis wrote, All that Orphus 
Ephesus, so he's the founder of this religion. Possibly he wasn't a real person, possibly was, we don't know. Transmitted through secret, sorry, all that Orpheus transmitted through secret discourses connected to the mysteries, Pythagoras learned thoroughly when he completed the initiation at some place up in Thrace. So apparently he went to Thrace. Remember, that's where the Orphic religion ultimately gets the truth. And Bob, spelled weird, the initiator revealed to him the wisdom about the gods that Orpheus acquired from his mother, Liz. <laughs> Bob and Liz, famous names, oldest time. So where he got this influence from Orpheus, it's definitely apparent in Pythagoreanism, but there's speculation about how it could have happened. So Proclus here is arguing that he actually went up to Thrace and there's another place that he went. One of the arguments is, no, he got it on Crete and it was big in Crete at the time. One of the other arguments is that um, Orpheus was an actual real person and he was there in Samos at the time that Pythagoras was born and living. Those are some of the different stories and some of the different arguments for how uh, Pythagoras was ultimately exposed to this. <clears throat> now remember, Pythagoras comes before Xenophanes and Heraclitus. So here's some of the earliest quotes we have on him. Pythagoras. Oh, I already told you this one. Once they said that he was passing by when a puppy was being whipped, and he took pity and said, Stop! Do not beat it, for it is the soul of a friend that I recognized when I heard it give tongue. <laughs> There's the actual story I tried to summarize for. Heraclitus. Pythagoras, the son of some guy, practiced inquiry beyond all other men and selecting of these writings, made for himself a wisdom or made a wisdom of his own, a polymath, an imposter. <laughs> so I'm stealing everyone else's ideas. Ion, relating to Pythagoras, distinguished for his many virtue and mod, distinguished for his many virtues, yeah, virtue and modesty, I guess it works. The same for his many virtue and modesty, even in death, has a life which is pleasing to the soul. If Pythagoras the wise truly achieved knowledge and understanding beyond that of all men. So, there's some of the earliest references we have to people actually talking about this guy. Okay. Alright, so, Pythagoreanism. Again, it's viewed as an offshoot of Orphism. So it's assumed it has a bunch of similar elements. Uh, they believed in two separate realities, a higher reality and this world, and believed that the body was a tomb for the soul. Your soul is trapped in this body, it ultimately wants to get out of this body and be back with the one. Okay. Body bad, soul good, soul wants to get away from the body. Believed in metapsychosis, that's the belief that all souls are immortal and that after death, a soul is transferred into a new body. So, cycle of reincarnation. You receive rewards and punishment for the deeds of one's present incarnation. What you do in this life will be rewarded when you die. You might get a better incarnation or a worse incarnation after that. Pythagoras claimed to remember several of his past lives. Uh, new Pythagoreans were chosen based on merit and discipline. Early on, they underwent a five-year initiation period of listening to the teachings and silence. Mm -hmm. So it's often speculated that he had uh, initiation uh, processes very similar to what the Egyptians had back in Thebes. So it's often thought while well, he comes as an offshoot of Orpheism, a bunch of the rites and initiations that you're required to go through actually resemble that of the priest down in Egypt. That's a speculation. <clears throat> List of taboos. Here's things you're not allowed to do. An example. There's a big list of them. One, to abstain from beings. We already talked about that. Two, to not pick up what has fallen. Three, not let the swallow share one's roof. Four, not to stir the fire with iron. Five, not to walk on haggis. Now, there's two ways that these are typically handled. There's the historians who say, ha ha ha, look at the silly things he believed. There's other people who say, no, 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 that's not what he's saying. These are used as uh, little phrases to help you remember lessons that you were supposed to have learned. And so when it's, remember not to walk on highways, what they really meant, that's interpreted as, well, here's the interpretation. With this, he forbade following the opinions of the masses, yet to follow the ones of the few and the educated. So the, the argument there is they didn't mean any of these literally. It's just something they would say to help you remember the actual lesson. So it's like an aphorism. Yeah. That's what they say that these were supposed to be. 
And then uh, the Pythagoreans, they established a famous uh, analogy which was used a lot after this. They say life is like a festival with three types of people. There's the worst type of people, the lowest type of people, the athletes, the ones out there competing for honors. Then there's a second tier of people, second worst type of people. There's the traders, the people who show up at the games to make money. And then there's the best type of people, the spectators, just there to see and learn. <laughs> and somehow, theory is tied to this, I think, or theorem. Somehow, it type, it's tied, it's etymology types to uh, being a spectator. So, I think that's backwards today. Right, it's the exact inverse of how we would think about it. Right. We would say, ah, oh, wasting your time. At least you're making money. Okay, that's impressive. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, music turn, father of music turn. So, story goes, after passing a blacksmith shop and listening to the tones of the hammer on the anvils, he went home and experimented with this with a monochord. A monochord, just one string pulled tight. So the idea is he heard one guy hitting on his anvil, and he heard a certain tune every time he did it, and he's walking past on a smaller anvil, heard a tune that sounded like they were in harmony somehow. So he went and started playing with, seeing if size was somehow related to harmony. And with this, he starts discovering the foundations of music theory. So he discovered harmonic progressions, the relationships between the length of a string and the harmonical note it produces. This is considered the first empirical discovery of a natural law and the first example of a physical law being phrased in mathematical terms. He described this mathematically. He said, if you want to get, we would say, one octave higher now, he said, if you want to get that note, use half the string. And use exactly half the string. That gives you exactly one octave higher as an example. So he's the first one actually laying this out explicitly. Now, he was amazed by this to discover numbers in music. Here you got sound. How is it that numbers somehow perfectly describe sound? And so it's not that this is where it starts seeding in his brain. Maybe numbers can describe everything. Is something as arbitrary as the sounds coming off two anvils being hit can be somehow perfectly described with numbers? Maybe it's possible to describe everything with numbers. So if something like music and harmony can be expressed mathematically, then what can't? That's a big question. The Pythagorean answer, nothing. It can all be expressed with numbers. <laughs> but we have to get intuition for the way that these guys thought about numbers. They do not think about numbers the way that you do, where I wrote 10 right there. We don't have these numerals. Early on, there's not a lot of difference between thinking about uh, numbers, thinking about stones. Uh, you're going to see the Pythagoreans are mixing up numbers, Mixing up geom uh, arithmetic, geometry, and physics. They're going to be conflating all three of these into one. And so your numbers aren't really different from your geometrical objects, aren't really different from the physical objects of this universe. And that way they're going to tie everything in this universe back to actual numbers. So they represent numbers with dots. Our numerals come much, much later in history. They had a shorthand of using a letter, a Greek letter, to represent a lot of dots. But they didn't think about the letter pi as a number. They thought about pi as shorthand for however many dots. Oh. They're thinking in terms of dots. Okay. Okay. To understand their philosophy, it's important to get how they're grasping numbers. It's still much more primitive than what we have now. And so one is associated with a single dot circle right there. Our first linear number, then, is two. Because it's two dots. With two dots, we can start to get a line. So one is a zero-dimensional number. Our first two-dimensional number is two, because we can start to produce a line with two. You can also use three, four, five, da, da, da. Our first planar number starts at three. You need three dots to get your first geometric shape, a triangle. They're going to complete triangle and three dots. Okay. And four is the first solid number, your tetrahedron. The simplest three-dimensional object you can make requires four dots at each of those vertices. Yeah. You see the picture? Yep. And in this way, they're going to complete dots with geometric figures and geometric figures with things that actually exist. And they are going to argue that everything is made from numbers. This chalk is made from numbers. And this hopefully is starting to give you some of the intuition for how they're going to make these arguments. 
Okay, so they were the first ones to start making a bunch of discoveries about triangular numbers. What's a triangular number, like three? It's a number that when you do that many dots, you get a triangle. So three is a triangular number. Six is a triangular number. 10, 15, 21. They like these triangles because triangular numbers are composed of all the numbers. Three is one plus two. Six is one plus two plus three. 10 is one plus two plus three plus four. 15 is one plus two plus three plus four plus five. And so these triangular numbers somehow for them encode all numbers. Because you add up all the numbers to get your next triangular number. All the numbers that come before give you a triangular number. Now they also do a classification of square numbers and oblong numbers. They associate odd with square numbers, and they associate finite with square numbers. They associate even with oblong numbers, and they associate infinite with oblong numbers. What do they mean by square numbers and oblong numbers? One, square number, because it makes a perfect square. Four is a square number. If you look at those four dots, it gives us a square. Nine is a square number. Those nine dots make a square. 16 is a square number. Those 16 dots make a square. Now, why do they type odd with square numbers? Because to get a square number, you're adding up the odds. One is a square number. To get the next square number, you add three. One, two, three. We add that to one to get our next square number. To get our next square number, you add five. One, two, three, four, five. To get our next square number, you add seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. To get our next square number, we would add nine dots. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And so the square numbers are composed by adding up the odd. Make sense? Mm -hmm. In like manner, the oblong numbers are the numbers you get by adding up the evens. Two, four, two and four together. So two is an oblong number. Six is an oblong number. Uh, what do we add next? 12 is an oblong number. These ones were adding the evens. So we start with two. Then we add four, then we add six, then we add eight, getting this more rectangular shape. So square numbers, oblong numbers. Now that's why these ones are classified with the odd, and these ones are classified with the uh, even. Now how do they classify it with the finite and the infinite? He calls square numbers finite because no matter what you do, how big of a square number you choose, the ratio of this side to this side is always the same. This has length 4, this has length 4, 4 over 4 is 1. So it has unity. 3 over 3, 1. 2 over 2, 1. 1 over 1, 1. Over here on the other hand, let's look at the ratio of its sides. 2 to 1 is the same as 2. On the other side, we get 3 to 2. That's a different number. This is 2, this is 3 halves. Over here, we get 4 over 3. Then we get uh, 5 over 4. Then we would get 6 over 5. Dot, dot, dot. We always get a different ratio. And so with the oblong numbers, you get infinite proportions. With the square numbers, you only ever get one proportion, unity. And so the square numbers are finite. You've got to complete your concepts here to understand the Pythagoreans. And in this sense, the oblong numbers are infinite. Okay. Very interested in proportions. Yeah. Pythagoreans think everything should be able to be described in terms of proportions. Okay, <laughs> now what did they think the fundamental stuff was? Thought the fundamental substance of the universe was numbers. Kind of like a primitive form of atomism, thinking about each of those dots as somehow being real in this universe, every number. For them, no distinction between arithmetic, geometry, and natural philosophy, or science, or physics. Whatever you want to call that. <laughs> For the elements of numbers are the elements of all things a direct quote. Okay. Now, they didn't just find cold mathematical patterns. They also had this mysticism in them, this numerology. They went further than this. They said one is reason, two is opinion, four is justice, eight is love. <laughs> so it's always weird. You got them making amazing discoveries, and they've always got that weird mystic element to them. So very strange. Here's what Aristotle has to say. The Pythagoreans, as they're called, devote themselves to mathematics. They were the first to advance a study, and having been brought up in it, they thought its principles were the principles of all things. Principles being the principles of mathematics. Since of these principles, numbers are by nature the first, and in numbers, they seem to see many resemblances to the things that existed and come into being, 
Since again, they saw that the attributes of the ratios and of the musical skills were expressed in numbers, since then all other things seemed in their whole, in their whole nature to be modeled after numbers, and numbers seemed to be the first thing in the whole of nature, they supposed the elements of numbers to be the elements of all things, and the whole heaven to be musical, to be a musical scale and a number. So literally seemed to think everything was numbers and composed of numbers and ratios of numbers. Okay, let's attract this. This was our special symbol. Special symbol for a lot of reasons. Is this their cult symbol too? Yes, <laughs> probably. All right, Tetractus. Tetractus is 10 dots. So it's the sum of the first four numbers. One plus two plus three plus four in this triangle shape is what we call the Tetractus. This was their special symbol. And they associated it with a lot of different things. So one of the first things they did is they said, look in the Tetractus. Look at the ratio of one to one. That gives you unison. Look at the ratio of one to two, that gives you what we now call an octave. Look at the ratio of two to three, that now gives you what we call a fifth yeah. in terms of music theory. Look at the ratio of three to four, that now gives you a fourth in terms of what we call music theory. Yeah. And so in this way, you can describe the basics of the notes that they use to start constructing things. It goes a lot further than that. They assign some particular pitch to the top here. Speculation is A4, 440 hertz, if you want it how I want it. <laughs> in terms of hertz. And then they capture all their notes using these, this ratio. So if you were to take that and you were to give it a ratio now of one to two, in other words, uh, if you were to double the length of the string, then you cut the frequency in half, and so I get you from A4 to A3. In a similar way, if you were to cut it at a ratio of one to three, it gives you 146 hertz, or the note D3, etc. A2, D4, E5, A6. And so in this way, they associated all these notes with each other, okay. capturing these ratios. Okay, they go beyond this. The top represents a point, which I also used to represent pitch. Two dots, this row, represents the line, which I also used to represent a step. Three dots here represents the plane, which I also used to represent harmony. And then the four dots here, they used to represent the tetrahedron, Somehow, gravity, I couldn't figure that one out. <laughs> but we're getting more into reality here. As we go up to four dimensional objects or things that actually occur in our space. And this harmony, it's often useful to also think about harmony as motion and motion as harmony. They tie harmony with motion of things. Because remember how strange that is. You take a string and you pluck it and the string goes back and forth like this. And that regular motion somehow produces sound. So they're going to think all regular motion produces sound. And so harmony and motion are very much tied together in the Pythagorean mind. So this might make more sense if we thought about that as motion and then that gravity as physical things in this universe. Now, another way that they thought about it, the tetractus, is actually representing the tetrahedron. Where these are its three corners and you think about that middle point as coming out, trying to give you a 3D rendering there looking down on the tetrahedron. And they had their ways of trying to encode all the Pythagorean solids into the shape as well. And so if you hold, for example, an isosahedron dice at the right angle, it will fill out this shape right here. Yeah. So they also associated the solids with the shape and saying that the shape somehow also encodes the five Pythagorean solids. Uh, Tetractus, okay. So they tie the point also with unity, the line somehow with power, the plane with harmony, the cube with the world. Should be the cube there, should be the, uh, te not the, should be tetrahedron there, not the cube. Okay. So that person made a mistake there. <laughs> now, another thing that they liked about the Tetractus is, so they used a base 10 counting system. So with their base 10 counting system, by the time you count to 10, you, by the time you count to 10, you're now to a higher order one. And so by the time you get back to 10, you're back to one. Okay. And so now you're kind of back where you started, in a weird way, if you kind of don't think too hard about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
So let this shape the tetrachus. Now, at a prayer, here's how the prayer went. Bless this divine number, thou who generated gods and men, O oh, holy, holy tetractus, thou that containest the root and source of the internally flowing creation. For the divine number begins with the profound, pure unity until it comes to the holy four. That's the bottom. Then it begots the mother of all, the all-compassing, all-bounding, the firstborn, the never-swerving, the never-tiring, holy ten, the key holder of all. Another one, part of the Pythagorean oath. By that pure, holy, four-lettered name on high, nature's eternal fountain is supplied. The parent of all souls that living be, by him with faith I find, with faith find oath, I swear to thee. So they take this detractus quite seriously for a lot of reasons. One more way that they thought about this. So they thought about the monad, the top line, as being representing the supreme being, divinity, or the totality of all things. How do you get the totality of all things? Because when you get to 10, you're back to 1, because it's a higher order 1. <laughs> 2, the dyad, is matter. This second line represents matter. How does it represent matter? It represents matter through a combination of representing both the limited and the limitless, or the paris and the apuron. We've seen that apuron before. Yeah. So when we get into their, uh, some of their cosmology for how the universe came into being, they think that there was the one, the limited, and it breathed in the void, the apiron, the limitless, and thereby produced the universe. Things somehow started producing through that process. Okay. So you can kind of think about like a cell splitting. Yeah. I'm the one, I breathe in enough apiron, and eventually I split into two, and then split into three, then four, and then we're back to where we started because that's ten and ten's one. <laughs> and we're ready to produce the next thing. I don't know. But that's the connection there. Now, the triad represents harmony. Some people argue also representing past, present, future, uh, or motion. And then the tetrad representing the cosmos, or representing the four elements, water, fire, earth, air. And so that's why that one represents the cosmos. So cosmos, motion, or time in some sense, actual matter, and then the one that everything comes from. So you've got the one, then matter is introduced, then motion, then you have your elements. And that's the cosmos. Something like that. <laughs> now, they had their fundamental opposites. We have this as an actual list. They thought that these things were fundamentally opposite to each other. Okay. So they put the limited on one side and the unlimited on the other side. They put the odd on this side and the even on this side. Remember that the limited is with the odd, because the odd's with the square. And the ratio is always the same. Whereas the unlimited is with the oblong. So square and oblong are down here. So square, limited, and odd. I already tried to explain how those three are tied together. And oblong, unlimited, and even. How those are tied together. Now the one is also tied in the same sense because the square kept giving you just that one ratio. Plurality, that's over there with the unlimited. Right and left, probably should have switched the order I put these columns in. <laughs> Put the left on the right side and the right on the left side. Uh, male and female. Why male and female here? Uh, the idea is that uh, the female is the one who ends up doing the splitting to become more people. Oh, she's the unlimited. She's the unlimited. The male's the one. Plurality. Yeah, the plurality. Is on the same side as the female. Rest over here, motion over here. Uh, not sure, probably somehow tied up in the ratios again. Straight and bent, not sure. Light and dark, not sure. Good and evil, sorry girls. <laughs> but here's what they thought were the fundamental opposites. Associating some of those with each other and other ones with each other. Some of those connections, try to make for you the best I can. I can't connect all the lists. Okay. Now his most famous discovery, Pythagorean theorem. So I told you that he was over in Babylon, and Babylon had just tables and tables of what we called Pythagorean triples. They had tables of like 3, 4, 5, 5, 12, 13, 6, 8, 10, 7, 24, 25. And the Babylons knew that if you construct a triangle with those as its lengths, so if I construct a triangle so that 
This side is three cubits, this side is four cubits, and this side is five cubits. Then it will give me a right angle here. And so they start recording all these Pythagorean triples that seem to give you these types of triangles. Drawing out a picture for you of the case of three, four, five. So drawing out this case over here on the right. How does that work? So over here, we've got a square, three squared. Over here, we've got side length four, four squared. And the result is three squared plus four squared equals five squared. So there are also numbers that satisfy this relationship that this number squared plus this number squared equals this number squared. Nine plus 16 equals 25. 25 plus 144 equals 169, et cetera. So Pythagoreans had tables and tables of these things. Pythagoras wants to prove, is this always the case? Can we prove when this relationship holds? Is it the case that if you use these sides to produce a triangle, it's an exact right triangle? For the Babylonians, who cares? Good enough for my construction purposes. It's close enough to a right angle. Is it perfect? That's a great question. So one of the ways that the Greeks start differing from these guys. And so he ended up proving the Pythagorean theorem. So what's the Pythagorean theorem? Given a right triangle, the square whose side is the hypotenuse is equal to the sums of the areas of the squares on the other two sides. Any right triangle, construct the square using this side, its area will always be equal to the area of the square using this side plus the area of the square using that side. Uh, I don't know, you guys want to see the proof of this? It's not too bad. Sure. We'll see if uh, our chalk pulls up. <laughs> or the chalkboard. So try and get my two squares here. Pretty much just a connect the dots picture. So over here, I'm going to label some points. And I'm trying to label them. So this distance right here, from here to here is A. This is B. This distance, I'm trying to make the same as that. So this is A. This distance, B. This distance, move that point down a little. This distance A, this distance B, this distance A, this distance B. Now, I'm going to connect these lines. I'm going to try and draw a triangle similar down here. Point, point, this is meant to be A, A. This is meant to be A, this is meant to be B. A, B. B, B. Notice that, what is this length right here? It's A plus B. Mm -hmm. What's this length right here? A plus B. What's this length? A plus B. What's this length? A plus B. So they're both squares. The area of this square is what we call A plus B squared. That's why we call that square. It gives you the area of a square with that as a side length. Similarly, the area of this thing has to be A plus B squared. So both these shapes have the same area. Now we're just gonna draw them, connect lines a little bit differently. We're gonna break down the area inside this shape. This little square right here, it has side length A by A. So this piece has area A squared. This is a rectangle. Its area is base times height, so its area is A times B. This one, its area is base times height, so it's B times A or A times B, same thing. And then finally, the area of this remaining square is B squared. Now we're gonna come up and do the same thing here. Looking at this square, or we're going to call this side length here C, so all these side lengths are C. So I'm going to call the length of this hypotenuse of this triangle C. I'm not going to prove that all these triangles are congruent, but they are, simply because I can't draw very good on this whiteboard. So I won't argue that that's a square, we'll take that for granted. But if that is a square with hypotenuse C, what's the area of this inner piece? C squared. C squared. And now the area of each one of these small triangles is half the base times the height. So this is one half AB. For that, for that, for that, and for that. So let's add up our areas. Looking at the top triangle, I've got one half AB, one half AB, one half AB, one half AB. So I got that four times. So I've got four times one half AB. Sorry, don't know why I did parentheses there. I was going to do some. So I got four one half ABs, so that's for those triangles, plus C squared. And that has to be equal to the area that we have down here. What are the areas that I have down here? I have an A squared. I have an AB and an AB, so I have two AB, plus two AB. And then finally, I've got this B squared, so plus B squared here. Now, four times one half is two. 
So 2AB, 2AB, same on both sides. Subtract 2AB from both sides, you get A squared plus B squared equals C squared. That's roughly how the proof would have gone. Very pictorial. Anyways, so there's a Pythagorean theorem. Now they also proved proof of incommensurable numbers. What are incommensurable numbers? So they demonstrated that there are incommensurable lengths by proving that the square root of 2 is irrational. Now, something is commensurable if it is common measurable. Can I find some length that I can use to measure both these things? If I can, then they are commensurable. Okay. So, we've got some square here with side length s. I come up with some unit that goes into this side perfectly. Some unit small enough, maybe when I count it out, it goes into this exactly 100 times. Then when I try to measure this side with that length, it will not go into an even number of times. I'll always have a little bit of leftover if I try to measure it. You might say, okay, that didn't work when I took a hundredth of this. What if I took a thousandth of this side length? Got something that small. Then would it be small enough that I could go into this? What if I took a ten thousand? A hundred thousand? What if I took one trillionth of this side length? Will it finally go into this equally? And the answer is no. Otherwise, the ratio of these two side lengths would be a rational number. It would give you a ratio. So proving that the square root of 2 is irrational is the same thing as proving that no matter how small a length you choose, if it perfectly goes into this side of the square, it can't perfectly go into that diagonal. Okay. Impossible. That's what they proved. Now, this is very disturbing to the Pythagoreans because they thought that harmonies and ratios described everything. And so they now found out that these two things, very simple, a side of a square and its diagonal, cannot be expressed with this ratio, with this harmony. It very much undermined their whole doctrine. But anyways, since this couldn't happen, this leads the Greeks to conclude the square root of 2 was not a number. And this is a belief that lasted for a long time. What we now call the rational numbers, that's what people thought of as numbers for a long time through history. It was a huge leap when someone said, why can't the square root of 2 be a number? And if you've ever gone through uh, Euclid's elements and wondered, why is Euclid working so hard to do these proofs with geometric figures instead of just using algebra and arithmetic? And the reason is because geometry can talk about things that numbers can't. This length right here is not a number. And yet we can construct that with geometry just like that. No problem. But arithmetic can't talk about it. So geometry somehow seems to be able to talk about concepts that arithmetic can't. There's these things that aren't numbers that we can get with geometry that we can't get with arithmetic. Now, of course, square root 2 is a perfectly good number, and we use it now. But it took a long time for that little leap forward in thinking to happen. Anyways, the story goes, since uh, the square root of 2 being incommensurable undermines the Pythagorean theory so much, there's a story that a man named uh, Hypatius something was supposedly drowned for revealing this fact to outsiders. <laughs> so he supposedly, a uh, Pythagorean, he went, told other people about this fact, and they drowned him for it. So that's the way it's working. All right, his cosmogony. I already talked about this a little bit, but the universe originated when the unit breath in the void, or sorry, when the unit breathed in the void, and when the limitless became bounded by the limited. So our universe is somehow what happens when the limitless is applied, or when the limitless is breathed in by the limited. I don't know. The only thought I can think for this is remember that as we start with the limited, the unity, one, as a breeze in, I think it's supposed to build a tetractus, and then the tetractus is supposed to represent a tetrahedron. which is then a physical thing in space. And then since the tetractus is also 10, it's also somehow a higher order one that can now breathe in again and expand again somehow. I don't know. Okay. Something like that. But the unit breathing in enough void produces more units somehow. <clears throat> now, here's kind of a weird one. They thought that there must be a counter earth 
Why does there have to be a counter-Earth? They thought that there was an Earth always on the opposite side of the sun from us. We didn't mention that they thought that the Earth goes around the sun, but they did. But not the way that we think. They thought that that's what created day and night. So it's going around once every 24 hours. Not it's spinning and taking a year to go through. That's a much later development. But anyway, so they thought they loved this number 10. And so because they loved the number 10 so much, there must be 10 celestial objects. And what are the celestial objects that they knew about? There's the sun, there's Mercury, there's Venus, there's Earth, there's Mars, there's Jupiter, there's Saturn, there's the moon, there's the stars. They thought the stars were all in one sphere, huh. rotating. We need one more. So there must be another planet on the opposite side of the sun from us at all times. That's why. Because it has to be 10. There has to be 10 celestial objects. So amazing breakthroughs in some ways, and then uh, complete numerology in other places. And then, yeah, concluded that the Earth goes around the sun in a day, not a year, but still thought that the fire was at the center of the universe. <laughs> Last thing they were big on was harmony. They're finding the ratio in all things. They think that there's harmony in all things. They thought that as the object, uh, music up the screens, I guess we'll get to that when we get to it. Uh, they thought disease was due to a lack of harmony in the body. They describe all this physical phenomena in terms of ratios and harmonies. You got a fever, you got too much heat in your body, you need more coal in your body. Right? You got hunger, uh, don't have the right ratio of food in your body. I don't know all the ratios that they had, but apparently uh, some famous physicians came out of the Pythagorean school. Now they held that as medicine brings harmony to the body, so music brings harmony to the soul. Very good for you to hear the music. They also believed in what they called the music of the spheres. Now go back to how strange it is that I take this string, and if I just move it up and down, suddenly sound comes out. It seems like regular motion produces sound. And so you watch the planets move. They're moving with regular motion. They must produce sound. So they thought that the spheres, the music of the spheres, is all these things orbiting in space. Believed in the music of the spheres. Now why can't we hear them? You can. You hear the music of the spheres all the time. You hear it so much, you don't know what to contrast nothing with. So you're unaware of it because you don't have anything else to contrast it with. You've never heard nothing. All you've ever heard was the music of the spheres and the things on top of that. So that's why you don't know it's the same. And then... They bring harmony into Greek philosophy. Harmony sticks around for a long time, becomes a major concept in Greek philosophy from here on out. Uh, some historian says, it is not too much to say that Greek philosophy was henceforward to be dominated by the notion of the perfectly tuned string. Harmony in all things. And so that ends Pythagoras and the Pythagoreans. Picture encapsulating him. Here he is, you got his Pythagorean theorem, doing his geometry structures. Got the tetrahedron over here with the tetractus above him. Genius, mathematician, Mystic cult leader. I don't know. Right. <laughs> All right. So that finishes off Pythagoras. Next week, we will start on uh, Parmenides. We don't need that. We'll cover that next time. Parmenides. Parmenides is the first guy that we actually have their arguments. So there is his poem. I would recommend to you, if you're interested, to go read his poem before next time. His poem, the whole thing is like a 10 to 15 minute read. It's only the first half of the poem that we care about. So you can Google Parmenides' poem and quickly read through it. Probably seven minute read to get through the first half of the poem. But that's largely what we'll be analyzing next week in Parmenides. Anyways, so that will be next week. Uh, any questions you want recorded? All right, see you then. We'll see the big answer to Heraclitus. It comes from Parmenides.